Once you're using blockchain without knowing that you're using blockchain is when, frankly, the opportunity is over. Yeah. So right now, the more complicated it is for people, which is what I tell them, the fact that this is difficult and hard means that there's an opportunity here. For myself as a business owner and using merchant services, and I'm paying three, four percent merchant fees, now I can take payments via crypto for a fraction of a penny. Yeah. You know, I'm in. So it's a huge opportunity. We're still really, really, really early in this. The key in to investing once you're an adult, or even say over 30 or 40, is the term harvesting. When are you going to harvest your crop? Yeah. The first thing I look at when I look at investment is what's the likely time horizon mm -hmm. for when this investment will return me either current cash flow or residual cash flow or cash flow from growing the business and selling it to someone else. That's going to be the most important criteria, the time return for harvesting and making an investment as you age. I think every single person should be taking 10% of their take-home income mm -hmm. and automatically placing that into some sort of a long-term investment and learning as much about business and advertising as possible. The hack, if you will, to creating income on demand is by having an audience. Even if it's a few hundred people mm -hmm. who actively digest whatever you put into the world, we can turn that into enough money to do damage. Money revealed. As you can see, there's certainly a lot of information here and there's a lot more to learn. But of course, it's worth our time. Why? Because this is about your money, it's about your financial future, it's about your security. All those things are very important. And I want you to know that we all learn a little bit differently. So when you own Money Revealed, it will include transcripts so you can read, it will include audio so you can listen, as well as the videos and many other bonuses. So check out the packages that we have, pick out the one that's right for you and own this information. And as you're considering that, I want to invite you now to jump into episode four with me and let's learn more. I'm a great admirer of Mike Dillard. I've read his newsletters for a long time, and he's someone who is greatly admired in the entrepreneurial world. We were excited to go to Austin to sit down with him and gain insight and wisdom from him. And he's just got a style and a delivery and a way of communication that is extremely powerful and compelling, but also it's just no hype. What you see is what you get. There's great insight here, and it's something that I'm very excited to bring to you. Enjoy my interview with Mike Taylor. Mike, you have such a great reputation. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. So uh, thanks for making the time. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. So let's talk about uh, maybe just your entrepreneurial journey and background. How did you get started in being an entrepreneur? Oh, gosh, that goes back to my days in high school mm -hmm. and waiting tables at the original Macaroni Grill in Burlington, oh, wow. Texas. Yeah, uh -huh. which was the same building as the original Rudy's Barbecue. And I used to mountain bike race competitively and... I needed money to fund that, so I'd, I'd bus tables uh, at night during school. Mm -hmm. And I really earned an appreciation for the lack of freedom that comes with having a job. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that I'd miss out on a lot of good times with, with friends on the weekends. And I'd come home at you know, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, exhausted, smelling like food, and would head back home to my parents' house, turn on television uh, that late at night, and there's really only one thing on at 1 a.m. back in those days, which was infomercials. Uh -huh. <laughs> so watching Tony Robbins and Carlton Sheets and all of those guys, and that really just exposed me to the fact that there was other options available and options without limitations, which really appealed to me. So it was a natural fit, but that was the inspiration and started playing with 
uh, you know, starting little businesses way back in high school and college, and that's where I got my start. What did you study in college? Uh, <laughs> First semester was biology. Yeah. I was going to be a dentist because at the time my uncle was the most successful, wealthiest person in our family tree. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, if I have no other, other interests, that seems like the smartest thing to do. Uh, immediately found out what beer was <laughs> when I showed up to the dorm because I never drank in high school since I was cycling. And my first semester I got a 1-3. <laughs> um, so immediately changed changed plans and I went to summer school on probation, switched over to marketing and did well there, but uh, I honestly never went to class. I went to Barnes and Noble and I'd sit in the business section reading books on the floor, skipped all of my classes and then I would go pay 50, 60 bucks to go to the cram sessions, you know, three days before you get all the old tests. Great. And that's what I did for five years until I passed with a 2.0. <laughs> and uh, my theory on that was that I went to class as much as I need to and automate it more. Yeah. Uh, so I already knew I wanted to, to be an entrepreneur, so the degree for me was yeah, kind of pointless. So. What did you do when you got out? So what was your first business venture? First business venture was in the network marketing industry, mm -hmm. and this is Web 1.0 days. This is early 2000s, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, this is pre-social media, no YouTube, Facebook, mm -hmm. pre-MySpace. Uh, but I had a mentor that had been working with me over the phone for about a year named Stu out in California. And I said, Stu, I'm packing up my truck after I graduate a week later and I'm coming to learn from you until I figure this out. And how did you was, find Stu? I mean, how did he come into your life? Uh, probably through the network marketing business mm -hmm. I was in at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's what I did. I packed up my old Chevy truck with everything I owned from my dorm, said goodbye to the folks, drove to California. Got to San Diego where he was and realized I could not afford anywhere in San Diego. So I kept going to Temecula, mm -hmm. found a $300 a month apartment, uh, had my bed, my desk, and a chair, and that was it. And the living room was full of boxes from my, my memorabilia and college stuff. And that was September 10th, 2001. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, wow. I got a phone call from mom, freaking out. And that was, uh, that was a big change in plans because... At the time, if you're selling opportunity, if you're selling hope, if you're selling a brighter, better future, and all of a sudden the world changes overnight, that's not really something that people are in the mood to, to talk about at the moment. Right. And so our, our plans at, at that time really took a dive, got a job at Best Buy selling computers there in Temecula mm -hmm. for probably three, four months. Couldn't pay the bills at seven bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour, whatever I was making and eventually headed back home to, to Texas. And it was a, a tough lesson learned, but, but interesting timing. And yeah, so that was the first, uh, that was the first venture. So uh, maybe just as a, uh, now with the reflective wisdom after being through this, the, the role of a mentor in the development of being an entrepreneur and the, and the role of timing where things happen, because you're also mm -hmm. on the heels of the dot-com bubble burst, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of process, the 9-11 happened. So, you know, how, how timing might influence your plans. Timing is interesting because it can, it can throw a wrench in a certain set of plans and it can create opportunities in different ways if mm -hmm. you have the skill sets to capitalize on that. And at the time, I didn't have any skills. Mm -hmm. I was still trying to figure it out. So I don't think at the end of the day it would have made a difference either way because mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But... It was, I think the determination was the biggest piece of the puzzle. And I really made up my mind at that point that I was gonna become an entrepreneur. I was basically gonna die trying. Uh, you know, I'd planned when I couldn't make rent or pay my cell phone bill one month. I was like, okay, I can get a gym membership. I can take a shower there. Maybe I can find an air conditioned rental unit and I'll sleep there and then I'll figure it out. And that's where my thinking was going. There wasn't any plan B or, you know, idea of quitting, so. So what's interesting is that um, a lot of people might have reacted in that circumstance by saying, uh, well, I guess I'm not meant to do this, you know, the way things unfolded, which mm -hmm. you know, the meant to be thing is, I always find that to be a confusing premise. But, uh, but in, in your case, it was like there was, you weren't dissuaded you know, by the circumstances, you were still going to work to go through them. What do you think the compulsion was? I mean, because this is really the heart of an entrepreneur, isn't it? The idea of having a job and giving up on everything I wanted to do in life was infinitely more painful than living in a storage unit. Yeah. yeah. 
That was yeah. it. That was it. Just that simple. Yeah. So then what unfolded from there? Gosh, moved back to San Antonio, got a job uh, briefly in Dallas recruiting surgeons. Is the biggest piece of advice I ever got was a mentor in that industry at the time. And I'd gone on for five years and failed, didn't make a dime for five years in a row. And it got to a point where I was like, okay, something's got to change here. And he finally gave me a really good piece of honest advice. And he said, Mike, the reason you're not hitting your financial goals in this industry is because you're not capable of getting the result that you want. You're not that person right now. And you've been chasing these opportunities, if you will. And I put all the responsibility for success on something outside of myself. Mm -hmm. Either it was the business or the product or the marketing materials, but I thought success was gonna come as a result of those things. Mm -hmm. And it finally dawned on me when he said that. He said, if you wanna go make, let's say $50,000 a month, because that was my big lifelong dream at the time. Mm -hmm. He's like, you have to become a person who's capable of achieving that. And he's like, you're not mm -hmm. right now. You're not, you don't have any mastery of any skill sets whatsoever. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. And it was a big light bulb moment for me. So from that point forward, I dove in head first into every book I could find on sales, marketing, mm -hmm. lead generation, and copywriting specifically. I was very shy at the time. I hated talking to people in person and selling. It was just the scariest thing in the world for me to do, even over the, even over the phone. Right. So I learned how to sell via writing, mm -hmm. via copywriting. And it took me about a year, year and a half of just going into every course I could. And I'd sit down at night uh, and print out successful you know, sales presentations and letters from some of the greats like Dan Kennedy or David Ogilvy and, and guys like that. And I would just rewrite them out by hand. And I did that every night for a year, about a year. And I learned that skill set. And all of a sudden, I was like, man, I can really sell something here. Mm -hmm. And then I taught myself how to use Google AdWords. And now how do I get eyeballs in front of what I've written? Mm -hmm. And that really changed everything. Uh, I applied that skill to my network marketing business at the time. Started recruiting people for the first time ever. Built a team pretty quickly of about three or 400 people. Mm -hmm. And realized I absolutely hated it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was like five, six years of pursuing this dream and I finally have it and I figured it out and it was miserable. Mm -hmm. uh, it just wasn't a part of my personality being a really introverted person. Right. So that was another big chapter where it's a um, decision point. Do I give up on this dream of building a business in that industry for six, seven years now or, or do I stick with it? And the solution or the answer that I came up with was, what if I could build this business in a way that I really enjoyed? Mm -hmm. And for me, the answer was that, to that was just, how do I get people to call me instead? Mm -hmm. How do I stop chasing people and how do I get them to, to come after me? And there was just a little twist, you know, at the time to doing that, which is providing value. Mm -hmm. If you put out value into the world, surprise, surprise, you help other people, they want to work with you. And, and essentially, there's this whole attraction marketing philosophy that uh, I happened to introduce to that industry at the time, so this was 2004, 2005. And no one in that world had ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. They'd never heard of online lead generation, they'd never heard of building a business online, they'd never heard of attraction marketing. And I ended up writing this little 50-page training manual for my team at the time that kind of talked about those philosophies and strategies. And all of a sudden I had phone calls from people all over the world saying, hey, can I sell this manual to my team? Can you make one for our team? So I ended up selling it for 40 bucks a copy online. I'd go down to Kinko's, I'd have 300 printed at a time, little cheap spiral bind binding for two, three bucks a piece. Put up a, a sales letter for it, put it on Google, and within, I think, three or four months, I was selling around $50,000 a month worth wow. of that book. And that was an even bigger shift, because mm -hmm. now I really felt like I was pursuing my talent and what I was good at, which was teaching. And I'd really discovered that. And so that really turned into an education company where we took the skills, which were brand new of online marketing, and taught it to that industry. And that turned into an eight-figure business. So, Wow. So uh, it's interesting because it seems like, and maybe this is an important foundation for an entrepreneur, is they have to know themselves uh, mm -hmm. really well to be able to kind of keep moving forward where you said, geez, I got what I wanted and I ended up hating it. So you said you had to learn things about yourself. Well, in the beginning, you're just like, tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. You know, put me in coach and I'll do whatever you say. And that's what I did. 
you know, for those five years. And I was like, okay, this isn't working <laughs> and I'm miserable. <laughs> What's got to change? And, you know, interestingly, and interestingly enough, that industry is built for people who love networking. They are extroverts. They love meeting people, talking to people. And you stick someone like me in there who shrinks in that environment mm -hmm. and then expect to see success. Yeah. It's an uphill battle for sure. So, yeah. So if, if uh, someone were to ask you, so what do you do for a living? How would you describe it? You know, previously I've, I've, I've really just considered myself uh, an educator in the fact that I tend to build companies based on my own personal challenges. Mm -hmm. So whatever my biggest challenge in, is in life, I'll go work on the solution and figuring that out for many years until I do, and then I'll teach other people who have that exact same problem what I learned. Mm -hmm. And that's really been the heart of what I've done for the last 12 years and two different companies. Now we're, you know, with that, I've been challenging myself in, in new ways to, you know, push myself as an entrepreneur in general uh, outside of that realm, which has been an interesting learning experience yeah. as well. So. Yeah. Well, recently you've been uh, writing a lot of uh, great copy because I've been reading it around uh, cryptocurrency. Mm. What, what got you attracted to that? You know, I don't remember exactly what caught my eye, but I found Bitcoin in 2012. Mm -hmm. I bought my first Bitcoin in 2013 on Mt. Gox. Mm -hmm. 2012 was a little too sketchy. You'd get on these forums or blogs and, and it would be, send this anonymous person your credit card info and money and they'll send you this Bitcoin back. Yeah. And at that time, you know, it was probably pennies, fractions of a penny. so. Unfortunately, I, <laughs> unfortunately, my radar went off a little too late, uh, but or a little too soon, I should say. But but 2013, I I set up an account on Mt. Gox and bought 500 Bitcoin and, and just was like, hey, if nothing happens, great, Vegas money. Right. If something does happen, great. And unfortunately, a year later, uh, Mt. Gox got hacked and I lost all my Bitcoin. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so, oh, wow, uh, that's really yeah. unfortunate. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I paid attention to the industry a little bit. I think I bought back in when Bitcoin was about $700 in 2015, 2016. I don't remember the exact date. And started to notice what was going on with Ethereum as well when it was about five, six dollars. And, and at that point, I really started to dive into that industry in a pretty big way. And I saw, I saw what was going to come from that in the next 10, 15 years pretty quickly. So. Was there something about it, sort of, uh, you know, either spiritually or philosophically, that you said, wow, the idea of a non-government controlled currency mm -hmm. intrigues me? Uh, is, is, is that one of the things that brought you there? Yeah, well, you know, for sure. Um, I was buying gold in 26, uh, 20, you know, 2006, 2007, buying silver, you know, when it was $7. Uh, saw the writing on the wall with the financial collapse and and for anyone who was studying economics and finance at that time, we should have seen the entire thing collapse. Right. And it took trillions of dollars in money printing to you know, prop it up and keep it alive. So I've always had a, a bit of distrust around people in power who have control over an unlimited bank account and right. credit card and you know, we're the ones who end up paying the bill. So yeah. Yeah, so now, uh, what is your, now that you've seen all the things unfold and it, things continue to unfold, it's a fascinating mm -hmm. world, the whole cryptocurrency and blockchain world, uh, what do you see moving forward? What do you think is going to happen? You know, it's really interesting. There's two, there's two sides of it. There's the, the truly decentralized uh, currencies like Bitcoin that basically cannot be controlled. Mm -hmm. And the real evangelists, the maximalist, if you will, of that world think that that's going to take over the world and become the de facto global currency. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. That'll require mass adoption. So what I've been most interested in following is how our government, specifically the U.S., going to react. Because right. you're not going to see mass adoption if they come out like China did and say crypto and Bitcoin is illegal. Right. You'll get pirates and rebels who will use it, but if you can't buy Starbucks with it, right. it's not going to reach that point. So following what the SEC's done and the policies that they've put out over the last year specifically, uh, they're looking to blend the two. Mm -hmm. And I don't know exactly how that's going to work out, um, but the genie's out of the bottle at this point. What really excites me the most, 
I guess, is the, the tokenization of securities and, and real physical assets. I think that's where the real revolution is going to take place here in the coming years when anyone can take their business or a house and tokenize the value and pull out the equity. You know, that's going to be game changing. Walk through what that means. So you have a house, you got equity in it. What would it mean to tokenize it? Well, at this point, if you want to essentially raise money mm-hmm. you, for your business, let's say, your, your biggest option outside of taking you know, private funding is to take it public, right. which is basically impossible these days unless you're a billion dollar company, right? So uh, that door has been closed. And now, essentially, you're going to be able to take any real asset you have, again, your business, your gas station, your home, your bed and breakfast, whatever it may be, divide it up uh, into shares, assign those to a token, and then share those on an exchange or let people buy them, invest in them. You can take quarterly profits and automatically distribute those based on a per token basis to everybody's wallet who owns it. And it can be as fast and as simple as that. So basically the token becomes your your stock or your equity that you're selling into a public marketplace that people can invest in. Yeah. And now you're, you're, you're starting to cite the whole, well, how's the SEC going to look at this? Because mm-hmm. you know, kind of there's regulation around securities yeah. and who can offer them and how yeah. they're offered, et cetera. So what's the, uh, the current status of, of that as far as the SEC is concerned? You know, I think it's going to be treated very the same way as stock. Anybody can jump on E-Trade and buy stock right now. Mm-hmm. The difference is what can what assets can you turn into stock basically and how easily can you do that and that's really where where the big change is going to take place so uh, lots to figure out yet but uh, I think that's going to be that's going to be game changing is there an emerging business of uh, people that would say hey I'm going to do the picks and shovels of this thing uh, where I'm going to create the platforms for people to tokenize because you know the, the chance person who says hey I want to raise some funds and I want to use this vehicle I mean you know what how do mm-hmm. they how do they do it so I, obviously you know the the trading platforms need to be built is is there a, a yeah. movement mm-hmm. underfoot to do that one of your the guests of this of this movie, Patrick Byrne, yeah, yeah, and T Zero, yeah, absolutely. So I've been following T Zero since since he's announced that, and obviously Patrick and I have a lot in common philosophy wise mm-hmm. when it comes to money. So I'm very excited about what they're doing. And uh, what role do you want to play moving forward in all this? You know, the role I've taken right now is to help introduce people to what cryptocurrency is about and how to participate safely. Mm-hmm. At this point, it's still the Wild West. Mm-hmm. I still see friends on Facebook, oh my God, my phone was hacked and my wallet was hacked and my Bitcoin's gone. Wow. And these are smart people. These are entrepreneurs. This is not mom and dad, 70 years old, trying to figure this out. And that's just a huge issue right now. So the role I've taken is, here's what cryptocurrency is, here's what crypto assets are, here's how they work from a layman's perspective, and most importantly, here's how you store them safely and, and transact safely. You know, even you you look at the infrastructure we're dealing with right now and, and outside of Coinbase, you're dealing with my Ether wallet and, and all of these other tools that unless you're an engineer, software engineer, or programmer, you, you're going to have a tough time trying to figure out just how to use it. And so right now I'm trying to serve as the guide around that stuff mm-hmm. and, um, and get people involved while the timing's right. So it's still education in essence, yes, right? So absolutely. now just pointing your educational uh, prowess toward this as compared to some of the other things that you've done before. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, as you mentioned that, is that um, I, I got very excited about uh, Bitcoin and crypto when it first came out because mm-hmm. of my own philosophy towards money. And uh, you know, just, I just wanted to morally support it and, and hoped it had a future. Uh, but what you say, and this is why it's a real need. I mean, I come from you know, my last business was a technology business, mm-hmm. so I'm not a, I'm not a tech adverse. I'm really tech you know oriented. And when I looked at what it meant to try to purchase Bitcoin, this is back probably when it was trading around six hundred dollars or so. Mm-hmm. I think we, were, and I, I said I'm going to go get some of this. You know, just just to morally support it, and also I think mm-hmm. it's a cool thing, and I think it might actually do something. We'll see. But. By the time I really started to look at what does it take to purchase it, you know, what does it take to have a wallet, what are the risks, how do you have to securitize? For me, it seemed so complex and difficult that I said, I can't imagine adoption at this point because, you know, I'm somebody who's kind of tech oriented and, you know, the average Joe is just not going to be able to weather this. As long as you're expecting people to scan QR codes and copy and paste public keys, yeah. you're not going to see it. Right. And you know, one, of the, one of the projects that I follow is all about putting the, 
the visual layer, if you will, on top of the blockchain. So everything is in the form of you know, a graphical asset, basically, and you don't see the code anymore. If you want to send someone an asset, you just swipe it or text them you know, this little digital icon, and that's it. And it's a digital asset at that point. It can't be yeah. copied, duplicated, and you own it. Um, we're going to see an entirely new world of assets represented with these. It might be a can of Coke at uh, you know, the store downstairs. Well, I, I have one on my phone. Mm -hmm. Represents a real can of Coke. I can go up to the machine. I can, you know, make that transfer and out comes a real can of Coke right. and the digital version is gone. And it's going to be really, a really neat future here, but we're just now going through the ideation phase of what it could be. So, And I, and I think that's going to be the tipping point when it gets kind of consumer friendly in that yeah. respect and the adoption I think will be exponential uh, at that point. Yeah, once you once you're using blockchain without knowing that you're using blockchain is when, is when frankly, the opportunity is over. Yeah. Um, so right now, the more complicated it is for people, which is what I tell them, the fact that this is difficult and hard means that there's an opportunity here. So, well, uh, were you surprised, um, like when I first was seeing this, that the government stayed passive? Because as you said, the genie's out of the bottle now. I thought the government would try to clamp down on this so quickly because you know the government control of currency is a major foundation of, of why the government thinks it's, it exists. Right. Um, and then suddenly it, it was out and they were doing nothing. Was that surprising to you? Yes and no. And I've had a lot of conversations with some really smart friends about this because I still don't understand why either. And, you know, so the global crypto market cap, the entire entire asset ecosystem around the world is less than $300 billion today. That's around the market cap of Walmart. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think they're paying attention to it, or at least they weren't initially because it was just small and a, and a fringe application. But I also don't think that they could get anything accomplished quick enough anyway. Does anything move fast in Washington? Yeah. It takes years. Right. And this is moving faster than any other technology has developed. Uh, the adoption is moving faster than anything else. And so I don't, even if they wanted to, I don't think that they would practically be able to make it happen. And so there have been a lot of smart entrepreneurs like Patrick who've been out essentially lobbying and educating Washington and saying, look, this is here, it's not going away. So now we have two options. Do we become the center hub of development and innovation as we were for essentially the first internet applications? Or do we let that go somewhere else to Singapore or South Korea or you know, somewhere else? And I think they're smart enough to know we want the brain power and we want the assets here in the US. So I think that's the way that it's going to go. Certainly a compelling argument, uh, you know, saying, hey, this is out there and, and now who's going to take the lead? Right. Yeah. Now, what about the wider application of blockchain, you know, beyond, you know, a, a, a currency, but, you know, what else it can do in the world? What are you seeing? Uh, well, beyond a currency and around the tokenization of securities, it really is just, it just comes down to people. And there's going to be two different types of applications. There's a truly decentralized application, which takes people out of the process. And it's, you know, it's funny, I have... I have a, a rare, very smart entrepreneur friend here in town who is not a fan of Bitcoin or blockchain. And, and he's like, I, I just, I know it's going to get hacked. I, I know people. Someone's going to come in and, and corrupt it. Mm -hmm. And it just told me that he doesn't really get it because you buy Bitcoin and use crypto because you don't trust people and you don't want people involved <laughs> yeah. in the process. Right. So, <clears throat> you know, I think the big 